Hi everyone. Um, this lecture is on diffusion models and GANs. Um, I apologize that I'm a bit late getting this up. I was getting very distracted <laughs> by potential papers to add to the lecture, including a paper you'll see that uh, just came out a couple of days ago. And so I'm sorry again to anybody who wanted to watch this earlier. All right. Um, and so starting with a very kind of broad view, in general, there's two types of models. There's supervised models where we provide data and labels and estimate a function to map the data to the labels. Um, and so we've talked about things like classification, localization, segmentation, object detection. You know, you might put under this self-supervised methods too, where you're able to kind of get your labels directly from the data. Um, on the other hand, we've also seen unsupervised methods in the course where we only provide data and there are no labels. There is no ground truth, um, but whether rather what we're trying to do is learn some underlying structure that's present in the data. And so we've seen dimensionality reduction, we've seen clustering, um, a little bit, you know, density estimation, autoencoders. And so traditionally, generative image models um, were a type of unsupervised model that generate new samples from the same distribution as the training data. And so in other words, given the distribution of the training data, we'd like to be able to model that distribution. And if we do a good job of that, data, the data that's sampled from the generated distribution will be indistinguishable from real data sampled from that domain. And so, you know, I think um, as economists, if we were thinking about how to go about this, we might think about explicit density estimation. How could we um, estimate that density. And I think that's the way that this problem was kind of in the pre-deep learning days traditionally approached as well. Um, that's not something that we're going to discuss here. Um, instead, I'll start by talking about implicit density and estimation. We, we want to learn a way to sample from the data generating process without explicitly having to define what it is because it's going to be a very, very, very complicated um, object. And so in recent years, um, diffusion models have largely replaced uh, GANs, uh, which stands for Generative Adversarial Networks, as the preferred technology for generating images, um, in large part because GANs are just notoriously difficult to train, and diffusion models are much more straightforward to train and can be GANs. Um, diffusion models are one of the hottest topics in the popular press conversation about AI. Um, there's like lots of discussion about whether they're going to replace artists, um, what's going to happen if they can generate really realistic fake news or spam, etc. So clearly this is a, like a super, super um, hot topic in the popular discourse on these models. I'd say people talk, you know, um, about stable diffusion um, and about GPT kind of in the same breath. Um, and these are really interesting issues. We can talk more about these issues um, and the ethics surrounding it in class on Thursday. Uh, but this is, in this lecture, I'd like to focus on applications that are of most obvious relevance to economic research, which are very niche applications in this broader space. Um, needless to say, they're not really the applications that most people think about when they think about these models, but they're potentially really useful to us. Um, and in fact, like a lot of the relevant literature is still in the GAN space with the diffusion literature not really having as much to say yet about these particular applications. Um, and so even though some people would say that GANs are Stone Age technology, meaning we've had something better for like a year and a half, um, I'm going to start with the GAN literature um, because actually kind of for the things we want to do, um, the best approach might still come, you know, at this point in time. Uh, from that literature. Um, so some applications to have in the back of your mind, um, cleaning up document backgrounds, um, data augmentation for layout recognition and OCR. Um, and so you can see kind of why this wouldn't be kind of a major priority of the diffusion literature. You know, who besides people like us who would like to custom train layout detection or OCR for historical research have a legitimate reason to want to generate fake documents. Um, but you know, if we can generate um, you know, very realistic synthetic historical texts, synthetic document layouts, that just kind of changes the game as far as OCR goes because then we can have a bunch of labels for free. 
Um, and so I think this is an area that's actually quite understudied and quite uh, promising. Um, super resolution um, might also be of interest. Okay, and so recall that our motivation is to be able to sample from the training data distribution, which is a complex and high dimensional object. And one approach would be to try to estimate or approximate this density. And I think that's where this literature started. And it's kind of intuitive why it would start there, but this is slow and it's really, really, really hard. Um, and so GANs use a different approach that turns out to be much more tractable. They sample from a simple distribution that we know how to sample from, unlike the complex distribution that real world images are drawn from. So they'll sample um, random noise or uh, sample a Gaussian or uniform distribution, and then learn a model that can transform a sample from a simple distribution into a sample from the training distribution. And that's gonna be a really complex transformation. And so what do we use um, to approximate complex functions. Um, again, if you get one thing out of the course, we use a neural network to do that. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the big kind of breakthrough in this literature came from a paper by Ann Goodfellow and collaborators, um, Generative Adversarial Networks, um, which is a 2014 paper. And their insight is that we can use a game theoretic approach between two adversarial networks. Um, to learn um, this function. And so we have a generator network um, that generates images from kind of the initial random noise that look like the real images. And then we have a discriminator network that tries to distinguish between the real images and the fake images. Um, and the discriminator is just a classification network that says, is this image real or is it fake? Um, and when the discriminator successfully identifies real and fake images, uh, no change is needed to uh, its model parameters, but the generator is going to be penalized with large updates to its model parameters because it's not doing a good job of fooling the discriminator. Um, alternatively, when the generator does fool the discriminator, no change is needed to its parameters, but the discriminator's parameters need to be updated. And at the limit, the generator would produce perfect replicas and the discriminator would always predict the class score of 0.5 for real and 0.5 for fake. Um, and so we can think of GANs as a two-player game uh, where we have parameters theta g from the generator and theta d from the discriminator. Um, and here d is the likelihood of the, that the image is real. Um, and we have discriminator output for real data x. Um, and we have the discriminator output for fake data that comes from this uh, GZ. Um, and to maximize the objective, the discriminator wants um, DX close to one and DGZ close to zero. Uh, to minimize the objective, the generator wants DGZ to be close to one, uh, fooling the discriminator. And so we alternate between gradient ascent on the discriminator and gradient descent on the generator. Um, and um, so in practice, this proposed approach does not work well. Uh, remember, GANs are notoriously difficult to train uh, because the gradient of um, uh, the, the object there is flat when we have bad samples and only becomes steep when the generator is doing a pretty good job. So instead, um, we max the likelihood of the discriminator being wrong. Um, and so this um, is the procedure for training GANs that comes from the um, kind of seminal Goodfellow paper. Um, the generator is an upsampling network with fractionally strided convolutions and the discriminator is a comnet um, uh, that's a real fake classifier. Um, and um, so there was kind of a further breakthrough um, in 2016 by Alec Radford um, and co-authors that uh, gave some practical tips that make a pretty big difference uh, to the performance of GANs. So they replace pooling layers with strided convolutions for the discriminator and fractionally strided convolutions for the generator. They use batch norm for both the generator and discriminator. They remove fully connected hidden layers for deep architectures. They use ReLU activations for all layers of the generator except for the output. 
and they use leaky ReLU in the discriminator for all layers. And so essentially you can see this is actually like a pretty convoluted architecture. And as the GAN literature advanced, they're making these, they're kind of tinkering with it and finding ways to make the training of this architecture more stable in practice since this is a really difficult uh, thing to train. Um, so this is an example of a generator architecture that comes from this Radford et al. paper. And so this, um, this matters in practice. And so if you look at the original uh, Goodfellow et al. paper and you see what it generates, I mean, it's not bad at generating in this digits, um, but the faces really don't look horribly realistic. You know, you're not going to take these generated images and, um, you know, put them on a fake news website and fool people, right? Um, and so it's kind of a proof of concept that you can do this, but it's not particularly realistic. You know, if you go through and make these changes um, that I talked about, which they're all kind of like small things tinkering uh, with the architecture, but they make a pretty big difference in terms of how realistic that your generated images look like. Um, and so this is just showing kind of the succession of GANs as people take the same original idea um, but then they make these modifications to the architecture to try to make them more stable to train. Um, you get more and more realistic generated images out of them. Um, and so I want to talk about one application uh, that we did that was pretty straightforward, um, which is to remove text bleed. And so basically we have images that look like the top one. Um, and you can see um, that there's quite a lot of bleed through. Um, from the opposite side of the page. Um, and, you know, we were concerned that this is affecting like OCR and layout detection, especially if you want to mostly do those things kind of off the shelf. And so we trained a GAN model to turn the top um, image into the bottom image. And we did this with entirely unpaired data because we don't have clean and dirty versions of the same image. But what we did have is we had a publication that looked like the top one and we had a publication from a different year with a cleaner scan that looked like the bottom one. Um, and so in order to train the model that turns that top image into the bottom image, um, we used um, an architecture called CycleGAN. Um, and um, CycleGAN is a model that can take an image from one domain and generate a synthetic version of the image with a specific modification um, and that, um, with a specific modification to it. And so the most like famous example in this literature that everybody uses is turning horses into zebras or zebras into horses, which you see there. Um, but you see also other examples like a turn a Monet painting into a photograph or turn a photograph into a Monet painting. It can take a photograph and turn it into um, uh, paintings that look like they came, you know, that are in the style of different um, artists. It can turn summer into winter, winter into summer, etc. All right. And so the real innovation of CycleGAN is that you can do this all on unpaired data. And so traditional image to image translation required paired data sets. And these are very costly to collect. In some cases, they would be impossible to collect. Like I want to, I, I, I have these, you know, I have these dirty um, uh, scans that I want to clean up. And if I had a clean version of them in the first place, I wouldn't need the model. And, and you know, I, the, like the whole reason for needing this model is I can use traditional computer vision thresholding methods to try to get rid of that background noise, but it works pretty poorly. And so I just, I don't have any paired data. And CycleGAN um, does not require images in the source and target to be paired. And so you here, you'd have a bunch of kind of photographs on one hand and portrait, or sorry, like paintings and different styles on the other hand. Um, and so CycleGAN simultaneously trains two generator models and two discriminator models. So one generator takes images from the first domain and outputs images from the second domain. And the other generator takes images from the second domain as inputs and generates images uh, for the first domain. And so if you put an image output for the first generator into the second generator, it should return the original image which is called cycle consistency. If you convert a horse into a zebra and then convert it back into a horse, the converted image should still look similar to the original. 
and cycle gain as a loss term that measures this discrepancy going in both directions. So it's analogous to a method used for text translation between languages. Um, you can think of it as kind of a, trans, a translator for images. Um, and so this is the architecture and you can see it, um, you know, it's going from X to Y and back to X and imposing a cycle consistency loss there. Um, in the same way, when it goes from Y to X and back to Y, there's also a cycle consistency loss imposed there. Um, and so the generators are deep convolutional GANs implemented using multiple residual blocks, and the discriminators use patch GAN, which tries to classify whether patches of the image are real or fake, and it is run convolutionally across the image, and then all responses are average. Um, so the paper uses Atom and a low learning rate for 100 epochs, and then an additional 100 epochs with learning rate decay um, with a batch size of one. And um, so this is an these are examples from the paper. Um, and as I said in this literature, they really love turning horses into zebras. Um, but you see them turning oranges into apples and whatnot. Um, and cycle GAN can be used for a style transfer where you take something in one style um, and turn it into another style. Um, and um, here it is turning paintings into photos um, and um, doing some uh, photo editing. Um, but they do um, also give examples of failures. Um, so it can fail due to distributional features of the training data. And so if the model is only trained on horses and zebras in uh, the wild, this is what it generates um, with the image here. Um, which is clearly uh, ridiculous. Um, and also cycle GAN um, often succeeds well with color and texture changes, but it tends to fail when geometric transformations are required. Um, and so in the document context, you know, it has a hard time converting fonts into another font, but it works great with getting rid of the background noise because that's ultimately kind of about changing the color and the texture. Okay, um, so this is another example where we used uh, fo fully unsupervised generation um, to take a modern font on the left and to generate the output on the right, which is meant to kind of mimic the, mimic the target, um, which is shown in the middle, but we don't use paired data. Um, it's... Um, totally unsupervised, and we do that with a model called Restyle, um, which is kind of a much more recent contribution to the style transfer literature. Um, so in the interest of time, I don't want to talk about this in depth. This is just kind of something we tried, and we haven't really pursued it um, beyond <laughs> kind of this um, example, but it seems to kind of work reasonably well, and we think it would be like interesting in the context of, say, FOCR. Right now, we're just using kind of digital fonts for the pre-training, but you could potentially use these unsupervised methods and just get crops from a whole bunch of different documents to generate just more realistic data um, for the self for the um the the self-supervised pre-training that would um, make it work better purely off the shelf without needing any target data at all. Um, it's just not something that we've had time to pursue, but we'd like to. Okay, but I want to talk about actual kind of published work on handwriting generation. Um, and so in particular, I'm going to talk about a 2021 model called Handwriting Transformers that I think is still kind of essentially the state of the art. Um, you know, there was one diffusion model that uses diffusion for handwriting generation, but it was not very impressive results. And it's kind of using an older version of diffusion. Um, and so to the best of our knowledge, this is kind of still state of the art, but maybe somebody will email me tomorrow and tell me something's just been posted on archive and it's better. Um, and so that's the, that's the nature of this literature, which is a great thing. Okay, so we have some desired style of handwriting that we would like to mimic, which is shown at the top, and then we have query text. And we want to write this query text and the desired style. And like, why do we want to do this? Um, again, this could be incredibly useful um, for generating data to train an OCR. 
Um, and I should say this model is for English. Like most of this literature is about generating English handwriting, which is a big problem if your interest is in, um, you know, ancient Chinese or something. Um, but, um, you know, that, 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 that's the way it is. I, I mean, I think there is some stuff to, to generate kind of non-Western handwriting, um, but most of the literature is in, in this space. Okay. And so this is showing handwriting transformer on the top, again, writing model in the middle and another approach on the bottom. And they're arguing that theirs is the best. And so we're gonna see what this architecture does in a minute, but in short, it is using a transformer within it and that is able to capture more of the long run dependencies. And so if you look at the word also underlined in green, um, you can see in the GAN writing, it's not, um, connecting um, all the components of it, which, you know, to connect, to have the, like the ligatures that connect handwriting, that's kind of a matter of long range dependencies. You have dependencies between the characters because they're connected. Um, and it kind of points to other, um, you know, more, more problematic things with these other approaches um, and argues that kind of their approach provides kind of the most realistic um, mimicking of uh, this particular style and we see that because we can you know we see here words that appear in both of them like um, throughout and um, also and you know the IES at the end and it seems to just it's mo most realistically kind of mimicking that style um, with the handwriting transformer and so this is a pretty complicated model um, which is, uh, again, kind of in the spirit of the GAN literature. I don't know how much of a pain it was to train. Um, and so they have a large generator network that contains a transformer encoder and a transformer decoder, and this is what's gonna actually kind of generate the handwriting. And these learn the long and short run dependencies and thus in can encode both global and local style patterns and the decoders generate the query text in a specific style. And so again, you see here like with the this word also, um, how it seems to be able to really capture these long run dependent, long range dependencies in terms of having the ligatures between different characters in the handwriting. Uh, this is not just a transformer model though, to make it more trainable, and again, GANs are difficult to train, they use a hybrid architecture it includes a CNN backbone to obtain sequences of convolutional features from the style images. And so um, the training algorithm closely follows the GAN literature, and there's going to be kind of four parts of this architecture that are important to its performance. So you have a discriminator network, it's convolutional, um, and it's uh, trained on an adversarial loss to promote realistic looking images. Um, and so kind of along the lines of what we just saw with the GANs. You have a recognizer network and there's a recognition loss and it's trained to make sure text images are real text rather than just hallucinations that somehow look like writing. And it's optimized with real labeled handwritten samples. Um, you know, and so you can imagine if you didn't incentivize it like that the model might kind of hallucinate things um, as we've seen with many other generative models, like in the case of GPT, it just hallucinates something that looks realistic, but there really are no such characters. Um, and that's um, not what we want. Um, and um, there's a style classifier uh, to be able to create a given style of handwriting. And that's trained on a style loss, which is just a classification loss over different styles of handwriting. And then there's the generator, which is this encoder and decoder transformer, and it's trained on a cycle loss that ensures that encoded style features have cycle consistency, such that the original style feature sequence can be reconstructed from the generated image. And so the total loss um, adds up all these different um, components of the loss. Um, and this is the model architecture. So you see, you know, you're giving it a style example. Okay, so like we want to generate handwriting in this style and you're encoding that with a CNN and then passing that into a transformer. 
Um, and then you also have the words that you want to, to write, the query words, um, and you're passing that into the decoder and you're passing the encoding of the style into the decoder, um, and then um, further passing that into a CNN decoder, um, and then you're gonna train that on these different losses. So you have your cycle loss, um, your cycle consistency loss, but you wanna also be able to predict the style and you have this adversarial loss um, where um, you're uh, trying to, to, to fool the discriminator um, and the recognition loss where this needs to be real recognizable handwriting. Um, and so again, you can see that this is a little bit convoluted, and I think in general this literature has found that it takes this kind of convoluted um, architecture to get something realistic, although we're going to see at the end of the lecture a paper that just came out like three days ago um, that is able to get around needing this convoluted architecture, but we'll see that they get around it by training on a lot of data for a lot of money. Um, Whereas this is like very convoluted, but it works reasonably well for this particular application with kind of more modest training requirements. Okay, um, and so that's GANs, um, and I'll look forward to kind of talking about them more in lecture. Um, and I'm going to make a, um, a separate video about diffusion models, um, so please make sure to watch both of the videos before class tomorrow. Thank you.